<laughs> have you ever seen that it, it's no, really funny uh, no i've definitely never seen that i just hit the record button so everyone else can hear you talk about this but i'll just do the basic intro hi i'm david march and uh, this is the land of confusion show the ricochet show for members by members where we interview members and today i have a special treat we brought in uh, titus kachira or titus i believe is how it is pronounced so titus and we also have gary on, who was instrumental in getting Titus to come to America a few years ago and introducing them around. So I thought we'd get the two of them on and we can talk to him about stuff and I can hang up on whoever's randomly calling me and turn off to vibrate. So anyways, uh, yeah, so we were just, you, you were ta telling us about some chorus you wanted us all to sing there and Gary. Yeah, well, I would, don't have the sheet music to distribute, but uh, <laughs> anybody watching this should, uh, you know, open a side window, freeze this for a moment, and take a look at the clip on YouTube, which I'm sure is there. Mm. Uh, it's Always Fair Weather is a sentimental comedy about three army buddies mm. who meet each other 10 years after the war. <laughs> it's based on a bar bed in 1945 that they won't remember. They won't come back in 1955. So they all come back in 55 and they discover that these old buddies that were once so close really don't much like each other anymore. Their lives have diverged wildly in 10 years. One of them has become a rich snob. Another one has become a total loser. Another one has become a borderline criminal. And yet somehow, of course, and this is a Hollywood movie from 55, they all become friends again. Mm. There's a scene where they're sitting in a restaurant and the, uh, there's a string quartet playing the Blue Danube. And it's a sit one of the earliest CinemaScope movies that really used that wide screen. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's a little bit hard to get the full impression from the somewhat squarish picture you get on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But as each of them is thinking, each of them has a voiceover and the camera moves in on them. Of course, their lips aren't moving as they're thinking to themselves, how the hell did I end up in this? A drink scotch at noon, bum, 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 with a hick and a goon, dun, 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 dun. Are these or the guys that I once thought I'd never live without? And so, of course, each of them is doing it from their own perspective. You know, the upper middle class guy who has no children, but gigantic mansion, mm -hmm. looks down on the other two. The criminal looks down on the other two. The, the pastry cook looks down on the other two. And they've each got a very good justification for it. I mean, in a way, you could say, well, you know, you could really do something about the American class system and how it's not what it's cracked up to be, just looking at this. In any case, highly recommend it. I don't think MGM makes any money if you go and look at the YouTube clip, so. Yeah, oh, no, I'm sure they don't. Uh... Completely uncompensated. <laughs> okay, so. Uh... I did not know this one. <laughs> there's lots of movies like that out there that we just haven't yet to get a chance to discover so i'm just curious titus did you discover movies via uh what's her name i'm just looking it up here uh arena margarita nisator or did you get it much later uh i was a, a, a child when the revolution happened actually mm. i was barely i wasn't even 40th mm. the uh, like I like to kid Gary around. I was uh, born a bouncing baby boy in the fight against capitalism, but then he <laughs> lost. <laughs> so, uh, so no, I, I saw things on TV and at the movies. There were cinemas, not, not many, uh, but you could see uh, Hollywood blockbusters of the 90s. Mm. And uh, I remind the audience that at the time, uh, these blockbusters were still fairly patriotic. Uh, some, you know, I don't think highly of like Independence Day. I was a kid when that came out, but uh, it was uh, undoubtedly patriotic. Uh, other stuff you'd see on TV, like uh, Die Hard, which was still fairly new when I was uh, a kid. And uh, that's a much better view of American everyman patriotism. But uh, that's the sort of thing you saw. The TV was full of American stuff. And so were, of course, the theaters. And that's how we grew up. No, I, I just, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's a documentary called Chuck Norris versus Communism. And yeah, I know. It. But the, that was the, the underground film industry in Romania before you were born. So I guess. Yeah, the, uh, 
uh, exactly. Uh, but of course, in the 90s, this only grew the trafficking in VHS. Yeah, you know, uh, there were improvised um, uh, video stores in apartment buildings. Some guy rented a utility room or something like that, or mm -hmm. would run it out of his apartment. He was a bit gutsy in one of the uh, less uh, nice neighborhoods of the capital or wherever else in the country. And so uh, lots of us got uh, video cassettes that way. They were not necessarily in good shape, as you can imagine, a rental VHS would be under such conditions. But it does teach you something. Uh, uh, I, I learned young that way that you, when, you, when you film something, you had better be really sure about what's where in the, in the frame because as the quality degenerates, you begin to have this uh, reaction of trying to figure out what's happening here. What am I looking at? And so only the things that were really meant to be uh, in, the, in the center of attention in the frame are, are, are clear there for you. So your focus of attention is, uh, becomes strained and therefore it's everything you do. And uh, yeah, it teaches you a lot about how people look at stuff. I'm kind of amazed at how quickly VHS tapes spread across the world in retrospect. Uh, there was a point in 1984 when I was basically, I was like the number three person in charge of a film festival. And my boss didn't have a uh, tape machine at home. So he'd come over to my house and we'd look at tapes. That's how we selected movies like 28 Up at the time. And uh, it was kind of... It, it wasn't rare, but it was, you, you know, things had been on sale in America since about 1977. But by the early 80s, relatively few people still owned, you know, had, had the player yet. And by 1986 or 7, it seemed like everyone in the entire universe had a player. And in fact, mm -hmm. uh, the Czech movie, Easy Money, is based upon, uh, to some degree, illegal smuggling of... Uh, pornographic videotapes in the Czech Republic in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of astonishing to me. It's like, well, they, ha they have the machines? I can't believe it. That's fantastic. But uh, yeah, it had a huge effect on uh, transfer of information. And stuff like that was so rare in those days. We had a, uh, I remember an editorial cartoon in the papers during the time of Nixon that showed, Amer showed Uncle Sam and Romania as this beautiful woman are dancing in an apartment building. And then on the floor below, you see Leonid Brezhnev with the broom banging on the ceiling. <laughs> Enough with this. <laughs> uh, interesting. Uh, so how did you uh, end up discovering uh, Ricochet? Um, I, I don't even remember. It's been a long, long time. And I was one of many, many people who was just reading stuff. Mm -hmm. And at some point, five, six years ago, no more than that, but I forget how long I'll have to check my profile. I decided to join because uh, I heard the podcasts and uh, that's what the guys said. You should join. Come on. If you like it, you should join. I thought they're right. I should <laughs> join. It's a is the, is the honest thing to do. And uh, then I also thought, well, you know, I might uh, write about these things. I was uh, not writing much. I was in grad school, I guess, at the time, or just out and uh, outside of writing on film, I wasn't doing uh, much, but uh, I got uh, caught up in the chat, in the community with all these uh, people who had all sorts of interesting things to bring up. And so uh, before I knew it, I started writing quite a lot of posts. Mm -hmm. I remember getting angry at many of your posts at the time. <laughs> yeah, that was the other part. There's, uh, you know, it's, uh, since what with, uh, especially how the publishing and uh, the, the public atmosphere have changed, I've mellowed down a lot, but at mm -hmm. the time it seemed like you could uh, have uh, fierce arguments like you would in a college dorm or, you know, uh, over beers when you're 20 something. And uh, it was all not, not necessarily in good fun, but mostly in good fun. And, yeah. uh, you know, you, you, you take it, you dish it out and you move on. Nobody remembers uh, next mm -hmm. week or something like that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but of course, that was before uh, politics got way uglier. 
Mm. You, you, so you feel this site's gotten too uh, uh, ugly in the, the chats now? Too uh, partisan? Uh, no, not that. Uh, I, I, of course, we all went through uh, nasty stuff, but I meant uh, a lot of political talk. All, all social media turned into mm. nastiness, and it wasn't this way 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, I joined Facebook 10 years ago or a bit more, Twitter. It was not this way. Now it's, oh, uh, I'm, I'm just tuning here into our conversation from chatting with some of my friends about some major league asshole who is apparently a professor, I think some kind of Ivy League university, who's taking time out of his busy day to explain how many books and articles he's published, how everybody who talks about woke being bad is trash because they have no intellectual output and uh, how important he is. And think, why would academics at prestigious places waste their time on Twitter to trash people? Mm. But that, that's apparently normal now. This was not yeah. so a, a long time back. And, uh, you know, the politics changed all of this, changed mm. social media, changed how people talk. And, uh, and so I, I wouldn't, uh, if I started out now, I would not write much of many of the things mm. I wrote six, eight years ago, when it seemed like uh, saying harsh things would never become politicized. It would just be people uh, having uh, violent, uh, different opinions about the civil war or something, which I mean, maybe people should have strong opinions. <laughs> so, <laughs> mm. I can certainly say a little while ago, uh, last week I was at this online conference and there was some guy started talking about uh, World War II and I started arguing with him. And then we kind of little, I was like, at a certain point I'm like, hey, we're not, we shouldn't be doing this. But I was like, this is so much nicer just arguing over what happened at the Battle of Stalingrad. And instead of like getting bogged down in the, in the garbage of the modern political fights. Yeah, somehow, uh, you know, who you were, your identity wasn't involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, even, even before 2016 and so forth, uh, uh, part of being on Ricochet taught me to be somewhat milder and more respectful of other people, mm-hmm. which I think perhaps many 20-somethings aren't. Certainly when I was a 20-something, I wasn't. So I have to say that I, I, I felt lucky to be in on uh, the whole public discourse and social media when it was much more civil. And uh, uh, if, if you misbehaved, that is, as I not infrequently did, you were told. And uh, it's not always pleasant, but uh, it taught me better conduct and better manners. And I have to say, all in all, I'm grateful for it. And it's, uh, uh, it, it's no small thing that uh, people uh, um, think well of you, mm-hmm. that uh, their opinion of you uh, matters to you. And of course, social media as it now is, is way too large for any of that to obtain. You're just screaming at billions of strangers and mm-hmm. there's none of the, of uh, knowing people. There's none of, well, you'll have to deal with these people in one way or another next month or next year, which tends to set limits and teach you to behave better. So all in all, Rikishi was much better at social media. And that's why I uh, started posting and got into the conversations. Because even at that time, of course, it was better than the comment sections. And uh, later, and I started publishing in publications that have uh, larger readership than Ricochet. You know, first thing you learn as a writer is never read the comments. Mm-hmm. The <laughs> so Ricochet was very different from that. And it was altogether a, a, a better thing since you really did, you know, you don't have a large audience, but you do have a real conversation. It's a trade off. Mm-hmm. I think there might be a problem that we've had a unique specific problem since 2015, 2016, which is in America, we have the Trump issue and Ricochet really, although there have been a hundred thousand arguments about Trump on Ricochet, the site itself, the membership is relatively supportive of him with a few big exceptions. Most people liked the judges. They liked the deregulation. They liked Mm -hmm. certain aspects of what he was doing. They didn't always love the tweets. They didn't always love the other stuff. But the thing about the the Trump era that's made it difficult for Ricochet is that it's developed a real stab in the back narrative. It's like, it's one thing when the entire site 
has divergent approaches to combating what they see as the cultural left. Okay, that's normal. That's what the site is for. It's a conservative site. But it's unusual to me to have so many conservatives at each other's throats, basically blaming their fellow members, basically their allies, their brothers, for what's happened to the country. So it's one thing to say, I think you should have been more supportive of the president on issue X, Y, or Z. It's another thing when you say this, this bloodthirsty traitor, you know, has done everything mm -hmm. possible to undermine the unity of this website and must be expelled. That's weird. That's something we've not seen on social media before. And once you, once you get it as, you know, central and Southern Europe in the 1930s show, it becomes very difficult for it not to become an extremely polarizing environment of mm -hmm. extremely strong partisans who won't hear a damn thing from either side. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of this in the wokeness debate, the, the wokeness crisis, whatever you want to call it. But in truth, we also have its little echo, its little mirror image in Ricochet itself. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame. You know, my hope is that a year from now, people will be back to conversation. They won't see each other as basically, you know, uh, assisting the destruction, the dismemberment of the United States, whatever. It's like if this heated rhetoric you know, cools off, maybe we can work with each other. Yeah. If not, yeah. then it's, it's going to be very bad because we don't work with each other. Guaranteed, uh, everything that people want here is going to go down the drain. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there will be some good news on that regard. I think we are getting not, we're coming to be near the edge of peak wokeness. I don't think we have got there yet, but we can see it from here kind of situation. And once right. that happens, they'll come down. I just, I have, I think the time frame's longer than a year. That's all. But I think there, there's more thing, just people, the more, uh, as I said to a friend of mine, the more they cancel, the less the people they can cancel and the more people that are on our side. I've been pushing the idea on Ricochet of the period roughly 1969 to 73 as being woke war one. Mm -hmm. you know, this is a place we've been before as uh, Henry Ford II says in Ford v Ferrari. He uh, He's obviously he's talking about World War II. I'm talking about a period when the public wanted to see Patton. It wanted to see Dirty Harry. It wanted to see Archie Bunker. And Hollywood wanted to show them Easy Rider. It wanted to show them uh, Elliot Gould uh, fighting the police with bricks. Uh, it wanted to show them stuff that in 1969 they fervently believed was worth, was worth putting every penny in because surely everything that had come before was going to be torn down and destroyed. Right. So mm -hmm. they went to all of this trouble and all of this expense and the public rejected it. They, they just threw it out. Mm -hmm. And that's how come, in fact, the cinema of the seventies wasn't an endless remake of I'm Curious Yellow and Easy Rider, but would turn out to be something more like Smokey and the Bandits, Star Wars and Rocky. Mm -hmm. So I'm not being complacent about this. I'm not saying this happens automatically. I'm saying that there is a kind of reciprocal balance that eventually cult culture will reach if the public is allowed to express itself. And that, that's the big question now. It's like, do they care? If, if the public rejects it, is there a small enough public that accepts it, that, that can pay for it? And that's why some of the more extreme woke stuff, sure, will be eliminated probably by the left itself because they'll see it's tactically damaging Mm -hmm. It's politically mm -hmm. useless. But to get to that point, it's, there's going to be a lot more damage done. And yeah, it may take more than a year. It may take more than five years. But I do think uh, common sense is a way of coming around. Mm -hmm. I think we're just going to run out of money, especially the, uh, <laughs> the virus has accelerated certain things, I think, which is kind of good. But I just means that... Uh, when we're all broke, they won't have. It'll be harder for them to fund their crazy. They're running out of money, so. Yeah, it's it's certainly true that seriousness tends to come when things get really bad and people notice that it's bad. Otherwise, it's not easy to sell seriousness when people have uh, 
quite a lot of dark passions they want to vent first. And uh, it's also true, I think, that uh, the 60s and early 70s showed this danger, uh, a suicidal temptation in the nation, but also that uh, uh, all in all, uh, Nixon and Buchanan were right about the silent majority out there. And uh, I do think that you know, uh, Gary mentioned Patton, that was, the, that was among other things, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's first Oscar for uh, the screenplay. Mm-hmm. And uh, of the American masters, the 70s were, uh, uh, you know, Coppola's decade. Uh, mm-hmm. All these great movies, the two Godfather movies, The Conversation, Apocalypse Now. And he was also the, aside from John Milius, the least liberal or most conservative of the mm-hmm. famous uh, uh, directors who came up in that decade. But still, uh, all these movies are very troubled about the past and the future of America. Will people hold on to their beliefs and what, how will Americans deal with uh, having power and having it taken away or, or, or dealing with a crisis? And uh, so I think that if there's going to be something like conservative art or at any rate art made by people who are both serious and love America, they're going to reflect a similar sensibility. This, uh, there's more than, a little, more than a little heartbreak at what's going on. There's not a lot of reason to be confident, but of course there's, a, if not confidence, there's certainly hopefulness in people who love the country. And maybe that will make for an audience for people who want to hear this. It might not be a silent majority anymore, but it might be a silent minority or at any rate, several silent minorities which concurrently could make some kind of majority. Mm. Uh, If I understand what you're suggesting, it's certainly the case that Wokies are not a majority and uh, they may be a very vocal and influential minority now given the institutional setup. But however much you would extend this Wokie liberal alliance, it is an elite minority. And so far, the fact that it's elite counted more, but the fact that it's a minority might count more later. And uh, I think I would add to what Gary says that in the past, at least, America made its voice heard through art. Now and then when it was needed in the culture, the voice of the majority came through. This isn't always uh, uh, reassuring uh, for the, from the point of view of art, but it is always reassuring for democracy. And one hopes that in this dec- decade it will happen again and that people, uh, that conservatives will realize that they need this, that uh, what they are used to doing, hearing and saying simply won't cut it. Mm. Um, I think I can point to a couple of big phenomena, right? That uh, you know, the, the most interesting fact about America in our times is that most people somewhat younger than me, let's say, 20-somethings, early 30s, are unmarried, or if not 50%, somewhere in the high 40%, and it's the same thing, really. This has never happened in American history, and uh, you wonder if it's ever happened in the history of any civilized country. We're really treading new ground, but it doesn't really feel new because people, in a way, are feel their weakness, they are, they are powerless. It's just life, it's just every day. Okay, I don't like my life, I'm young and kind of focused, but what can I do? That attitude uh, would need a kind of conservative moral confidence that says people should be aspiring and uh, breaking their backs to get married. You, you will not hate yourself anymore. Loneliness will destroy your confidence and your future faster than anything else. So, even just for the, for the sake of understanding what's happening. Why are we feeling this way? Why is an entire young generation going through this thing that uh, has not happened before? Just for the sake of understanding and expressing it artistically, you would need a certain conservative understanding that marriage is preferable to the alternative, that it's the way of life that should obtain. Not everybody doesn't need to be married, but most people do. And what most people need carries a certain moral importance. It's the way of life. And, uh, and so I think you could point to other things. Um, it might come across finally in America that uh, much of the society is uh, an enemy to young men specifically. That uh, you know, it used to be the case that uh, 
men were preferred in America and all sorts of social arrangements and sometimes legally or politically. But uh, since the 80s, girls and women have dominated education. And, uh, and so with other things gradually to the point where young men feel that they are in the crosshairs of some kind of conspiracy, the system. This is why uh, there's so much hatred of the system by young men, whether they are birdie bros or, or they're, uh, you know, Trump supporting uh, meme creators on uh, the darker side of the internet. But either way, young men are in a miserable situation, especially, and their passions are uh, not pleasant or uh, under control. And again, you would see, if, if you just look at the social facts, uh, conservatives are supposed to be less sentimental and therefore less cowardly than liberals. And so they should be willing to look at things. As I said, one thing is that young people aren't married and this has never happened, that bears noticing. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that young unmarried women by a vast, vast 40 points or more vote liberal, Democrat. And it's not likely that Republicans or conservatives will persuade young ladies anytime soon. It would be better if they did, but I wouldn't bet on it. But there is a natural ally waiting out there on the internet where conservatives don't really look. And that would be young people, young men specifically. These will be Republican voters if they can be attracted. And in some sense, they must be the future of the nation since they are the young. Mm -hmm. This, uh, I'm not sure the the war of the sexes has ever been uh, a political conflict in America, but I am sure it will happen in my lifetime. And that again means that somehow conservatives and Republicans have to understand what digital communities are forming out there. What is it that these young men are doing and saying and what might be, uh, what, what the opportunity is. A lot of unhappy young men have to become politicized even in their anger or else things get worse than that. Mm -hmm. the, you cannot have millions of uh, miserable, angry young men. This is not good for the country. No. <laughs> uh, As a historian, and, uh, I can say it's a terrible, and, terrible so, thing to have. Exactly. What do you think happens when there are so many young men who are humiliated by default in every aspect of society? It's, this does not end well. The, in America, to be a success, you have to have college. And uh, the, the education system shuts out men. This must lead to trouble. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we will see this for the next couple of decades, whether it is dealt with well, and what part political conversation, what part the arts, public speeches play is to a large extent, of course, up to us, to what we do. So I would say that um, to wrap this around all the, all we have been saying about how we talk online and social media, of course, people are going to start seeing crazy, responsible things when there is, they feel that speech and deed have nothing in common anymore. You can scream out your madness and there's no, there are no consequences because also it doesn't matter because you don't matter. People feel that way. Somehow freedom of speech has nothing to do with freedom of association. And when they are torn apart, and I think you could say more broadly, one reads the First Amendment and reads about a certain number of freedoms there. Now, if those things become dissociated, if people feel that it is no longer possible to, uh, to have freedom of religion, to have freedom of assembly for petition and the readers of grievances. What is going to happen with these people? After all, uh, complaining about things and making yourself heard makes the difference between a citizen and a slave. If you're a citizen, you don't just have to take it. If you don't like it, you can scream about it and maybe do something about it within the bounds of the law. So somehow the social media promise that we would achieve some kind of community, we would achieve some kind of togetherness, and it's all supposed to be an engine of desire. This is uh, going to make us all the same, a convergence of desire. This is why Facebook has a like button, but not an unlike button. This is why Twitter has a heart, but no heartbreak. This is why you can share things but, or retweet them, but you can't somehow diminish their uh, spread. 
It's all supposed to come together, but it turned out it didn't work. There's something fake about all this friendship and it doesn't build associations, communities. People aren't doing anything together so that they feel that this is helping real life. This is helping real human needs. And so they do irresponsible things instead if it's all fake anyway. Huh. Well, I got kind of deep. <laughs> I can definitely yeah. say that about uh, Facebook and that I was just thinking to myself, one of the big problems with social media is that it gives us this un... I've been going through some stuff. And one of the things that I've been going through is the fact that I've had connections with people I don't really connect to anymore. But Facebook implies to you, you have these connections. And I'm thinking about my parents and their generations. And when they would, uh, if they had a bad friendship, they would just move on and they get new friends and stuff like that. And they may never see these people again, but you're now connected to them forever for the internet and everything you ever say or did talking to them, you can look that up later and be like, oh crap, what was I thinking? In a way that before you never could because it would only be in your memory, in your head. Yeah, that's entirely true. Now we live under a regime of digital technology, which means perfect machine memory with instant recall, cheap or uh, free use and instantaneous transmission as well. And it's getting more and more searchable, right? Everybody's learning that uh, under digital conditions, somebody can look up something you said 10 years ago and hate you for it. Maybe mm -hmm. privately, maybe publicly, might ruin your career. So, you know, the machines remember everything and care about nothing. This is what we're dealing with now. We've made all this stuff, what are we gonna do with it? And what is it doing to us? It's never been cheaper to make a movie, you know, a good looking movie. I don't mean trash. Mm -hmm. It's never been easier technologically to distribute a movie. There's never been a time when you needed less of an intermediary, less of a goalkeeper to get your movie out. But the problem is even if you make your movie and even if you have a way of distributing it over the internet, Getting anyone to pay attention to it is, if anything, I think much harder than it was 50 years ago. 50 years ago, 1971, if you were an American independent filmmaker and you had something really extraordinary that you'd done in 16 millimeter, let's say, there'd be a place to show it. I mean, you would not get an Academy Award for it, but there'd be a little theater somewhere down near the university that would run it. You know, you, you had an opportunity. Now, Independent films are shown in regular theaters. They, uh, they have tremendous opportunities in effect that uh, didn't have decades ago. And yet, paradoxically, it's much harder to get people to pay attention to the good stuff. I mean, this is where Titus comes in and that's also where his uh, colleagues like Armand White come in, which uh, mm -hmm. you, you've, you've got to have somebody that you trust, a, a, basically a cyber pal, somebody you'll never meet in your life Actually, from what I understand, Armand is not particularly palsy if you know him in person, but yeah, he is sort of, just reading him, you don't think he's going to be palsy in person. <laughs> no, no. But the thing is, on the other hand, he's a damn good friend to art. And that's all mm -hmm. we care about in this context. You know, mm -hmm. that's all what, you know, we, we go to him. No, that. Armand is a great guy. I've, I've met Armand. Mm -hmm. We spent time together. He's a great guy. And you can just listen to our podcast. He's a... Uh, mm -hmm. A gentle soul to his friends, but as uh, but Gary that's was just suggesting, it. you are one of his friends. People he that's... doesn't like, and uh, you know he's he's very very harsh, and uh, you know he's very very protective of American cinema and of the American audience. Is the kind of, you know this is a very American sentiment. You don't like to be played for a sucker. You don't like mm -hmm. to be exploited. And when he feels that people do woke trash, that they do sentimental liberal stuff that plays or humiliates. The sentiments of Americans, he becomes very, very harsh. It's uh, that's that's all true, but I think not unexplainable. <laughs> well, that's it. You've earned the respect of somebody who has extremely high standards. I mean, mm -hmm. somebody who is like George Sanders and all about Eve. Uh, you know, he mm -hmm. he is just about the Addison DeWitt of uh, National Review Online, I would say. Mm -hmm. And yet, for example, if I wanted to know something about black cinema, I'd go to him first, even though he'd be the first person to denounce the cliches, the horrifying, uh, I don't know what you call it, 
residue, legacy of wokeness. He does it better than anyone. But at the same time, if an independent black film came out that cost $200,000, might potentially be valuable. I'm never going to see it otherwise. It's great that you've got somebody like that who's out there who finds them and picks them out for you. Um, and often that's what it takes. You'll have an audience that in fact is not as stupid as people think, but they have no way at the moment or they, have, they don't understand that they have a way to identify what's worth spending your time on, what's valuable and what is, what is the equivalent of a sugar rush. Mm -hmm. Uh, it helps to have people know the difference. You know, this is where Titus's role is, uh, is essential because honestly, you know, as conservatives now know that politics is downstream of culture, but they don't know a damn thing about how to fight culturally. They don't know a damn thing about what it is to take an argument, prove what a poor argument it is and make a better argument. And that's a, that's a craft that they have got to acquire and quickly in the much the same way. Again, this is a sort of dramatic analogy that uh, probably will get me banned. But, you know, when Israel was started after the war, Jews were being called upon to do things that they had never done culturally in their lives. They were called upon to become tough soldiers, ruthless, uh, maybe to a fault. And... To some degree, conservatives, and they sit around on their fannies whining, you know, oh, they're so unfair to us. Oh, I saw a movie and it was so mean to us. It's like, well, get off your, uh, get off your behind and do something, you know. If you can't make a movie, very few people can. Very few people have the talent. Think of supporting somebody who does. Think mm -hmm. of supporting people who at least can make the movies better out, out of their critical faculty, out of their... Uh, discernment. Uh, and you've got to help these people. And I know a lot of people on Ricochet have said very reasonably, Gary, how can I do this? I'm not a rich person. I'm not culturally connected. I don't know anybody in Hollywood. And say, so that's reasonable. But if you don't figure it out, culturally speaking, you're, you're going to die. Your, your culture, the things you believe in, are not going to be sustained if you think that you can merely stamp your foot in wine and somehow get Hollywood to come around to your side. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. It didn't work like that for the left. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to change the culture, you've got to be able to take risks. That's become much more dangerous today than it was 10 years ago. No question about it. You also have to be able to risk some money. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to say, I'm going to spend a million bucks and I hope the picture is good. But if I don't get my million back, I'm ready to spend my second million to do better. Mm -hmm. The left did that. The right won't do that. And, and it, you know, honestly, uh, there are a lot of things against us. And I don't mean to blame the victim here. But uh, too many conservatives are just whiny, cheap, and cowardly when it comes to culture. And you get what you pay for. In this case, nothing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would like to see some kickback. I would like to see, you know, the, the comatose patient show that he can at least make a fist. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to some degree, and I, I know Titus and I have disagreed a bit about uh, uh, Amari, but uh, Soab Amari has some very valid points. And one of the things that, although the tactics that he has and the tactics I have might, might differ, is that he's like, you know, you have got to stand up and fight. You cannot simply complain. <laughs> yeah, that I entirely agree with. It's, uh, it is indeed a, a very bad situation to be in when, uh, you know, people are being deplatformed or platforms themselves are being deplatformed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you end up in the situation where from politics to technology to culture, conservatives have to look at themselves and see a lot of defeats mm -hmm. and not a lot of victory or hope ahead. And this is a situation in which we have to build something that's much sturdier, something mm -hmm. that won't be easily undone by, uh, you know, some Silicon Valley tech corporation or by some uh, accusation uh, about wokeism, right? Uh, America changed in the moment when hello turned out to be replaced by your racist somebody I've never seen before, I've never heard of you, but you're racist and I'll try and stir a mob to maybe destroy your job. 
that change something that will not change back for quite a while. I have some hope that it will change back in my lifetime to a more easygoing America, like what I saw years back, but uh, I'm not holding my breath. I do think that we need to think seriously about what makes conservatives attractive and what gives conservatism a future. Hmm. And I think uh, that is tied up deeply with culture, with uh, the arts, with telling stories that allow us to think through what do we believe about politics, about faith, about government, and about the various aspects of life that speak to us most directly or most urgently. And, uh, you know, our whining should turn, to say the least, into craft and art. If we are not able to tell stories that bring people together, Mm -hmm. then all the whining is for nothing. If we, our stories are, uh, you know, just bad propaganda, that will not avail us anything. It might make for a few celebrities, but that's it. We need institutions that we didn't think we needed before, so we've never made them before. But in another way, we just really need to think about America. America made Hollywood before. It wasn't always bad. It used to be pretty great. Mm -hmm. It was sometimes patriotic, sometimes incredibly artistic, sometimes both. Americans did that. Americans can do it again. What America has done, America can do. But conservatives need to think that way to, to, in a way, because it's a very bad situation to raise their heads and to raise their sights, to be not just this part of America, which might be a majority or a minority or switch back and forth, but America altogether. It takes a certain kind of ambition. And indeed, we can't be cowardly or cheapskates about this. You're not going to get a hit the first time out the gate, maybe. Who knows? But even if you do get a hit first time out the gate, the second one might not be a hit too. Who knows? You have to build institutions and try hard. And uh, again, freedom of speech will not help us if we do not also have freedom of association, Mm -hmm. if we do not believe that we can do stuff together. The... A certain commitment of time and money to things that are worthwhile is going to make us all more dignified. The, you know, I'm, look, here's a somewhat unpleasant thing. Uh, I, I know Americans of an age who sit in front of Fox and scream at the screen. Mm-hmm. And, and they do that for hours. And that's, that's where their money goes. And that's where their attention goes. And, you know, if you've reached your social security years and maybe you're very angry now and then or you have some bitterness, you know, God bless, you've been through a lot, you've done a lot for the country, it's really up to your kids or grandkids to deal with it now. You've taken the, uh, things as far as you can. It's not up to you to be dealing with these things. But it would really, really help if people could look with some hope to some younger people and do something. Okay. And, uh, you know, in some cases, just who you donate to. In, in some cases, it's who you support. The, you know, this may surprise you, but young Americans do not have the confidence that old Americans do. Not just because they lack the experience that it takes decades to accumulate, but because if you're a conservative in this new situation, you're just coping. You're just trying to make it through the day or make it through this situation or be part of something you can't really believe in because your school or your job or your industry doesn't really represent conservatives or tolerate them. There's a terrible defeatism in the younger generation that people don't want to look at. There are good reasons for it, but it cannot go on this way. Now, this will mean also good things. Millions of people will move into red states over decades Americans have decided that they want to be in Republican states more than in Democrat states. And uh, that's a good thing, but not if red states don't rewrite their educational systems, if they don't invest in culture in the way they never have before. Mm -hmm. You can't take in these refugees, so to speak, from liberal America and not offer them a kind of confidence and hope that America used to have. 
how it can be done now is a somewhat more difficult matter. We're not in the situation of long ago. We do not have those habits that once were taken for granted. I mean, uh, just read the Reagan's uh, rather short farewell address where he says, we won the Cold War, which was urgent and great, and we restored the economy, which was also pretty urgent and pretty great, but we did not restore patriotism. As Americans born after 55 are not quite those of us, like those of us who were born before 1955. Mm. Different habits, different things you take for granted, different attitude to patriotism, and therefore also different attitude to the future. And so much more so is that to now. So yeah, it will take a, a certain courage and will, uh, like Gary says, people will have to take risks. People who aren't willing to trust somebody, to pay money for stuff, to be part of ventures, how will they have an assurance of a future for them and their kids? Mm -hmm. It takes a certain pride to say, we can do this. We can be part of something. We are not just victims to some asshole with a mob. <laughs> I can speak a little to this myself. I've made a, a friend who is a, a liberal who is a filmmaker and TV guy. And I've been, we've been, he's trying to rebuild his life after he got really big publicly canceled. And uh, we are trying to put together a documentary series and he's more than willing to hear my conservative things or like, so if you're a, a, a right winger, you can find some disaffected liberals or just artists who will do what you say because you have the money and you don't necessarily have to, you, you can work with the other side to get what your your message out because they want they want to pay. <laughs> yeah, I mean th that's true. There is a lot of disaffection in Hollywood that conservatives, in a way, cannot allow them to see because they hate liberals so much. And I'm not saying you should stop hating liberals, mm -hmm. but I think it's essential for people who are serious to distinguish very clearly between the elites and the operatives they hate and just the electorate of the Democrat party or just mm -hmm. people who live in Democrat states. Mm -hmm. Those are not bad people. And indeed you will find friends there, you will find people with whom to work in various cases, especially if they become political refugees in America. Mm -hmm. the, if, if they come to red states, you know, they, they might bring a certain experience mm -hmm. with them and it might be, they might be helpful in certain ways and uh, they should certainly be embraced. Uh, it's certainly the case that the red states should invite as many political refugees as they can. Right. Uh, it's weird to think of America that way, but it is true. And uh, uh, you know, I would go a few steps further and say that the just trying to figure out what works is hard. So I'm, you know, I'm here talking to you because in this circumstance, I don't want to fly over and go to CPAC. There's this premiere of a Roe v. Wade movie. The guy who made it, Nick Loeb, who is a, you know, is a conservative guy. He's a decent guy. And he made this movie. And in a way, it makes you wonder. It's premiering at CPAC. Why hasn't America ever made a Roe v. Wade movie? It's a touchy subject. Now you'd say, well, we've made touchy, transgressive, even shocking or indecent movies for a long time. Why is mm -hmm. this an untouchable subject? And on the other hand, isn't this something conservatives should be doing? Some of the people involved are, you know, conservative stars, the same uh, actors everybody knows, and uh, some of the people who people might not know who are behind the Gosnell movie a few years back and uh, you one hopes you know this this will be a success one hopes it's a good movie i don't know yet i talked to nick Loeb just the other day i'm gonna do a screening online since i did not fly into cpac and uh, hopefully it's a, a good movie and i can review it and recommend it to people and it can get distributed mm -hmm. uh, you know the other thing that came up in the news recently was much more high profile a lady who was in uh, this biggest TV show in America, The Mandalorian, the Star Wars show, yep. was fired for being- One of our uh, members' questions guts. is about that. So this is great. You can handle it. <laughs> the, this lady, Gina Carano, mm -hmm. was fired because she became a, a hot wire issue. Why? Because she is a strong, independent woman who speaks up for herself but mm -hmm. happens to have conservative opinions mm -hmm. or not even necessarily conservative opinions, just not wokey. 
Yeah. And uh, the good news is that she was signed by uh, the up and coming, apparently, uh, media business of the Daily Wire, mm -hmm. uh, founded, of course, by Ben Shapiro, who also distributed the film of uh, the Cinestate uh, business. Dallas Sonier ran it. He's the guy who makes these movies. It's a movie called Run, Hide, Fight, yep. about a teenage girl being in a sort of diehard situation, but in a school shooting, another very touchy issue for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. I've not seen the movie, so I don't know if people should or should not see it. Uh, but it's he, okay. I've seen it. It's a good movie. If that's, if you're into like diehard in a school, that's a, has a lot of social media commentary. That's interesting. Others, uh, I had one or two quibbles with it that were just like, uh, sorry, that's not how that goes, but that's, they need, you know, the directors often ignore things, logic to get the story done. So. Yeah, that's right. And uh, hopefully that means that uh, now it's got this distribution through the, the Daily Wire, it's going to have some success and people will judge as you are judging here. Is this something that we want more of? Mm -hmm. So that people know that, uh, you know, Dallas Sony should make some more movies, more like this or more like that, if he wants this audience. And other people should know that this is doable. As Gary says, it is easier to make a good movie now than ever before because the technology is at hand and it's cheap. But you have to really believe in it and try very hard because there, it's absolutely impossible for you to become successful. You can't bank on going to Hollywood and making a career or as it was in the 70s, go to New York and make a career. Mm -hmm. the, it's not gonna happen. It's a, it's a, a very unpleasant situation. Uh, I, I know that conservatives like to believe that wokies are killing all the talent and all the good things out there and ruining nice things, but I'm here to tell you something more unpleasant. Mediocrity and trash had won already, and so it was only a question of, do you want this garden variety trash or wokey trash? <laughs> and I mean, what's the difference? People went with the wokey trash. Mm -hmm. There was no real difference. That was the problem. Somehow, the, the industry had become bankrupt and pretty miserable. And uh, that's how we got this. It's not that it was paradise and then the Wokies came and ruined it a couple of years ago. It was really bad and the Wokies were just the next natural step. The, and so it's not easy to, as Gary said, how are you gonna distribute it? How are you going to get attention? You have the next great thing. You might be the next American master. How are you gonna get attention? Puck, you try. Uh, you know, there's, there are small American movies that are wonderful and directors who make careers that somehow conservatives don't even know these people exist. Mm -hmm. uh, I recommend Jeff Nichols, whose film Mud is a kind of Mark Twain on the Mississippi, you know, a kind of Huck Finn story, but it's in, set in Arkansas where Jeff Nichols is from. That was Oscar nominated and it starred Matthew McConaughey, a wonderful performance. And he's got other movies, all of which are wonderful, and they're kind of conservative movies, even though the man is not a conservative. I mean, not many in Hollywood are, but nobody watches his movies, and he's got way more success in festivals than with the conservatives who would look and would say, yeah, this is what young men are like, just what mm -hmm. you see in Mud. It's a wonderful Huck Finn Tom Sawyer story. Mm -hmm. Or Taylor Sheridan, the guy who made Sicario and Hell and High Water. These are yeah, that's what I'm fairly... thinking. I was just thinking of those great conservative movies. And uh, made the Yellowstone TV show, you know, yep, that's another Contemporary thing Cowboys in Montana, uh, Kevin Costner starring on the Paramount channel. Pretty, and you can just stream it on Amazon Prime now. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive. And it brings the Western back as much as we can now. Why isn't that guy more famous? Why doesn't he get interviews? Why doesn't he get some kind of interest from conservatives? Mm -hmm. It's all about American stoicism. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he reminds us that Americans used to admire Indians for their manliness and their nobility. Mm -hmm. And he's not ashamed to say those things and to show them in a very compelling way. Maybe we need to pay more attention to these things. And you know, it, I'm, it's my business, I run uh, the American Cinema Foundation as uh, Gary's successor. It's my job to tell people about these things, to write about them, to go tell colleges about it. You know, I have a, a lecture and to attract uh, people in writing, in, uh, in screenwriting, in the movies. 
-hmm. But uh, I have to say that uh, Gary is exactly right that doing it is incredibly difficult. Nobody wants to support things. Nobody believes in uh, supporting an institution that tries hard to help Americans out. It's, uh, sometimes it feels as though people would rather be miserable and scream at their TVs than be sort of happier and have hope in the next generation. That's not something I was expecting and it's hard to get used to. But at the same time, this is the situation we're in now, so we have to deal with it. We have to find what is worthwhile in culture and do the best we can with it and teach a new generation of writers how to do the job. Since we are decided that culturally America is split apart, let us make the best of it, which means that we can now teach people how to make movies, not just as Americans used to, but how to tell stories in a worthwhile way think really about what is cinema and how does it get distributed in our digital age? What can you do with this? And what should you be doing? What would be great stories to tell? Not just silly vanity projects or people desperate for celebrity. These things aren't available like glamour used to be in the 90s. You have to be much more serious to do it now. But if you love it, maybe, maybe conservative America will love you back. So we have to work on that. Well, cool. You know, conservative activist David Horowitz, he's pretty famous. He does uh, annual conferences around the country. And one of his top line ones, one of the fanciest ones, uh, was what he did in Colorado Springs each year at the Broadmoor Hotel. And you, you can't get spiffier than this, man. This is first class all the way. And he was giving me the thumbs up in 1998 because I'd managed to secure a place at the table next to the guy who had just sold J. Crew, the clothing store. He was loaded, rich. And he said, well, there's nothing I can watch on TV, nothing. It's all garbage. I said, well, I, you know, I'm looking around. You know, I, I didn't have Citizen Kane at my disposal. I just said, well, what about JAG? Uh, this is a show about uh, Navy lawyers. Very conservative. The people involved were fairly conservative. Uh, it was a show actually very popular with my friends. And he said, well, I'm not gonna watch that, it's on CBS. Now, you know, you, we can laugh at that, you know, <laughs> typical conservative attitude, you know, I want this, oh yeah, okay, here it is. Well, I don't want it anymore. But here's the kicker, as David explained to me after the meal, this guy had a net worth at the time we were having lunch together of a billion dollars. 1998 is just after Les Moonves took over CBS. Its stock price, because it had just merged with Westinghouse, its stock price had dropped to the point where if this guy had wanted to, he could literally have taken the phone out of his pocket and bought control of CBS before lunch was over. He I could swear. have done that. He had the power to do that. Instead, he not only didn't he do it, not only didn't he spend one one hundredth of his wealth on an attempt to change the situation, uh, he basically demonstrated to me that this is what I'm going to run into, running a nonprofit or arts organization on the right side of things, which is people automatically assuming, well, we can't win, so we're not going to try. We're not mm -hmm. even going to get up from the couch. We're going to sit here like 300 pound guys on their mother's couch watching the Olympics and say, well, we don't have a chance. It's well, get up off the couch and lose 150 pounds and maybe you'll have a chance. Uh, there's just so much conservative resistance to this that, yeah, it makes life tougher. Mm -hmm. And uh, sadly, it's the nature of conservatism. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we are prudent people. We're smart mm -hmm. people. We're not mm -hmm. stupid. We don't waste money. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sometimes, though, you've got to spend a little if you expect to fight. Right. And these people would like to win without struggle, without anything. They would just like some mysterious COVID-like plague to come along and wipe out wokeism in Hollywood. It ain't going to happen. You know, if they're going to have to they're going to have to fund a counterculture the way the left did 50 years ago. Okay. Well, we've been talking to you for a good uh, hour now, and I usually like to try this because when I find it go over the hour limit, people are, don't tend to uh, stick around. But is there anything uh, we want to go out on? Is it a good thing? 
maybe yeah we can go out on a somewhat more positive note mm-hmm. I, I i agree with gary i i go through this every day or at least every week since i run the acf people come to me with scripts they're working on with ideas for movies or shows and we can help with some of this stuff we can't help with others but we can never offer funding or a pipeline to production because this sort of thing is not something conservatives do Mm. that's uh something that really we will have to fix cinema requires quite a lot of investment and uh, maybe the conservatives can wake up and realize that we need our own media we need to offer things that people will want to see for a large part of the American audience, which is just waiting there. The, you're right that conservatism has this problem. If it hasn't been done in the past, we shouldn't be doing it now. But I think there will be a generational shift. A lot of us who are just in our 30s are looking around and seeing we don't have much to show for whatever happened before. We'll have to make things happen. And the more people are serious about this, the more they will want to help the the, the next generation in this way. I cannot stress enough how much I have seen through my travels in America, public spiritedness and deep wounds in people's hearts because they feel America doesn't love them back because they feel this is not the country that they love, that something is going wrong and maybe parts of it are rotten. And I don't think it's possible anymore to tell conservatives that they should like elite institutions. It's not going to happen. Just look around. Mm -hmm. New institutions are required and new media so that people have something to look forward to and and, and, then something that will channel and focus their patriotism, their public spiritedness, their care for not just what's happening today or what's happening on my screen, but something big that I can be part of and be proud of. People are deeply in need of this. And this used to be the American strong point. Americans used to pride themselves on the fact that in a crisis, they came together. People still do this locally. People still do this in a way that's hardly ever noticed, certainly not part of our public conversation but not in institution building. Americans don't associate the way they used to. And although I'm hopeful about many things about the young generation, because they have seen much more suffering of a kind that wasn't available before. Americans before did not have to live with thinking that it's all debt, joblessness, automation, and you're never going to get married and you can't have kids and you never own a house. This is a new uh, set of ideas to grow up into. And that might make for a certain strength and seriousness that comes out of suffering. Uh, You know, if if the 90s have taught us anything, it's that prosperity has debased America. Perhaps less prosperity will make people more serious. But there are things that young people do not know how to do well, and that's above all to associate, to do things together so that they do not feel helpless and hopeless. And I believe a lot of that will come to what we call culture, what we call the art, what we call cinema. To to take care of this will be to take care of the future of the country. People have to have the public spirit to invest in this. It takes pride and it takes a certain self-respect to wish to, to leave for the next generation something good to be remembered well, and not to give up, not to feel that we're, we're, we're lost, we're defeated. Uh, you know, I, I wake up every day on the wrong side of uh, social and generational trends, and uh, I can't say that it's going to be great. But uh, uh, as, as I said, I was born and brought up in a pretty nasty situation in Romania. And uh, I've learned that you can never give up. You can never let those kinds of Uh, thoughts get the better of you. You have got to look seriously for what reasons there are for hope and whatever it takes to get it done, you should do that. Americans admire that, I believe. It's it's, it's a kind of calling of the heart that you feel even when you're young, when you see the pop culture of America from previous generations. 
it was uh, indomitable. And I believe that spirit is still there. And so I do this, even though there's no success to show for now, but there will be later. Okay. Gary? Well, uh, Titus is the latest in a line of John the Baptists, you know, and uh, I hope his search for the, for the Messiah is in, in, entirely successful. I think, honestly, uh, he is, you know, I, I'm not flattering my old friend here, but he, he is the best qualified person in the world to lead this effort. When I say that, I haven't met everyone in the world, but I've met an awful lot of film scholars in America. And most of them right now, if they're not frightened to hell uh, about the idea of writing anything, they are writing something about how feminist poetry and the life of Maya Deren intersects with Ida Lupino or whatever. That's what Americans are doing. We, we honestly, sometimes we need to come up with better Americans. And in this case, we're ready to import them from Bucharest if necessary. <laughs> they will pull out. And, As uh, I kid my American friends around, I'm willing to do the jobs that Americans aren't willing to do. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You are doing the job that Americans will not do. Being proud of America. You know, and it's, I, it, it is almost impossible. I mean, look, I consider younger people to be my successor. He's the only guy I know who has the knowledge, the guts, and he's actually willing to stand there and let people throw rocks at him. What could be better for this job? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, I do have another thing. I can say something. Uh, we were listening to the pod, the Ricochet podcast a few weeks ago and uh, shortly after the election and uh, Rob was going, someone said, oh, what do you think of Trump setting up his own media thing? And Rob was down, uh, putting it down because he's like, oh yeah, go, good luck with that. Look at uh, Richard Ailes and Fox News and it took, they lost a billion dollars a year for 10 years before they made money. And I'm like, and then for me, the day after the election, because Fox and a lot of the other usual suspects of the right decided to go a different direction, I found something called Right Side Broadcast Net Net Network. This tiny little thing, I had no idea it even existed, but it's been around for a little while, and they do subscription-based news coverage, and, the, and I guess half their shows are... the. Uh, funded by the my pillow guy but i mean like we now live in a day and an age where you don't need a giant office in downtown new york you don't need everything we've been mentioning this the entire time you can just go out with your phone and start doing your own news and doing your own movies and you're doing your own tv shows and there's already people out there doing it so uh, when everyone thinks that you know you don't the good news like you said Anyone can do this and there will be an audience out there. It just won't be a billion audiences, but hopefully we'll have a million guys get into a thousand people and get to a billion that way. Well, yeah, there are new ventures, even in tech, trying to come up with a full stack, everything from your servers to your platform. Mm -hmm. And some of these people will fail. Some of them will succeed. It's, this is always the way in business, but if people do keep trying, Americans will succeed eventually. This is, you know, since I'm not given to flattery, but because things are so bad and there's nothing to win by it, I have no problem saying that uh, America is a great country that needs great efforts now. Mm -hmm. And if people want to live up for it, to it, they, they have a lot to do, but they will respect themselves. And people who do not want to live up for it will not have self-respect. That's the difference. Okay, well, I think that uh, well, we could go on for hours and hours, but uh, the, the ratio doesn't seem to like that much. So uh, it's been great. And I'm going to just hit the say bye bye to everyone and hit the stop record button and maybe say private goodbyes to you guys afterwards. So bye bye, everyone out there.